I'm David Flint, and this is Conversations with Conservatives, coming to you from Safe Wales TV on the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. This conversation is with Jim Ball. He's the Conservative Independent candidate for the seat of McKellar on the northern beaches of Sydney. It was a seat formerly held by the Speaker of the House, Bronwyn Bishop. And Jim is a leading commentator, very highly respected, and uh, for some years he was with radio station 2GB, the highest rating station in Sydney and probably the country, and also radio station 2UE, the other talkback station in Sydney. Jim, if I may begin, can you tell us why you're standing for McKellar? Thank you, Professor Flint. Well, look, like many uh, people, David, I was wrestling with this dilemma of who am I going to vote for? Well, I solved that problem. <laughs> I'm going to vote for me. Um, but we had in 2013 a stark contrast. There was Gillard Rudd and Tony Abbott. People knew that was there and there. They knew exactly what they were going to get. This time round, it's a Coles and Woolworths. Uh, it's, a blum, it's, it's a beige and vanilla election. It's blamange. Uh, we have two Labor parties, basically, as I see it. Many would disagree. Malcolm Turnbull, I guess, would disagree. And then we saw that we're seeing this drift to the left of the Liberal Party. And then we saw in North Sydney the pre-selection pre of uh, Zimmerman of the left. Uh, or oh, beg your pardon, they call themselves moderates, which I think is a hijacking of the language in an Orwellian sense. And then in McKellar, this is the seat I'm standing in, we saw the pre-selection of Jason Felinski, also a fellow traveller of the left, or a moderate, he said with inverted commas. <laughs> and uh, I decided, look, um, I like my garden, uh, I like the retirement years and working with my wife in her medical practice, but I can't let this go without a fight. So I've put my hand up, thrown my whole body on the line, and here we are, two weeks out from an election. You're very well known. You're very well known and you're respected. But uh, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't the Liberal Party say, well, when Malcolm Turnbull knifed Tony Abbott, and uh, it's, a bit, it's interesting, isn't it, we have two political assassins leading the, the two parties. When he knifed Tony Abbott, he was forced to accept a lot of Tony Abbott's policies, particularly in relation to the borders, in relation to taxes, in some respects in relation to uh, what they call climate change, what they used to call global warming. W wouldn't it be so that uh, he would say, oh, well, I'm going to the election and it's going to be very much an Abbott-like government? Well, he would say that, or he could say that, wouldn't he, as Mandy Rice Davis once said famously. But um, look, he, if, if he was smart, he should have gone to the people back in November, December last year, because the, the, uh, he, his ratings were way up there, his polls were way up there. But now he's had everything on the table until it's not, <laughs> then everything off the table, uh, you know, GST and all the rest of it. And so in that, in that, with the inflection of time, that's six or eight months, people have now seen that Malcolm Turnbull is a ditherer. And he's done nothing to disabuse the electorate of, of that notion. The people that I talk to out there, particularly over the last three weeks or so, they feel disenfranchised. They feel like they've got Labour or Labour light. As Henry Ford famously said once, you can have any colour car as long as it's black. And that, I feel, is, is what we're seeing at the moment with the election. And that is why there's this disappointment, this disenfranchisement. The people coming up to me all the time, whether it's handing out flyers or at pre-polling, they're all saying the same thing. And that is, I've always voted Liberal, but not this time. Wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, Mr... Turnbull say, but uh, I'm very strong actually because look what I did in the budget. I brought in this superb reform of superannuation and doesn't that stun everybody? Well, look, the superannuation grab is low-hanging fruit. 
he can't cut out to various payments of various kinds to various sectional interest groups, and there's a hell of a lot of them. Um, he can't raise taxes. I mean, Tony Abbott had difficulty with a $7 co-payment for, the, uh, for Medicare. So if you can't raise taxes, you can't do away with some of the generous payments that are going out or cut them back at least. You're left with, uh, you're looking around then for the low hanging fruit and superannuation is one of those. Uh, um, it was Peter Costello made the point that their uh, rearrangement of the superannuation is, pred uh, is predicated on people getting a return of something like five and a half percent on their investment. Well, I don't know of any superannuant getting that, that sort of return. You might have heard the Prime Minister on radio station 2GB speaking to Alan Jones in which he claimed that uh, people can expect to get 5% in balanced funds, but uh, you certainly can't get that from any very safe investment that is putting your money in the bank, can you? That's about 35000 I think, or something like that. Quite often this amount of money will be shared by two people. It'll be in one person's name, dare I say it, the husband's, but two people will be living on that, and it's something substantially less than, say, uh, what politicians receive as their superannuation. Yes, and uh, Mark Latham was the one back in, I think it was 2004, at that election, where he said if he's elected, he'll get rid of the generous politician super. And and uh, John Howard, of course, well, how do, you, how do you argue with that? I mean, he had to go along with it. And, of course, uh, the rest, as they say, is history. However, the, Mark Latham and all of those politicians uh, uh, that went before, uh, Bronwyn Bishop would be a good example, would be an, on the old scheme. That would be grandfathered, but all those coming since, uh, obviously not so. Is it curious that uh, that was grandfathered no retrospectivity was applied to the platinum politician scheme. They've now got a gold-plated scheme, which is better than any of us can have. But they grandfathered that. that but uh, most people say this change is retrospective. The ministers deny it, but I think they only annoy voters more by saying that. Well, it's an insult to the intelligence. And you say, isn't it curious? Uh, no, <laughs> it's, it's quite predictable. I mean, this is just... You know, they're looking after themselves. And here's me. I'm wanting to be one of them. My God, there's something wrong here, David. I've got to tell you. Just can I go back, though? I'm just thinking about the mood on the out could, there. Could I interrupt you on that and say you could be like Ted Mack. Ted Mack refused superannuation from both the state and federal seats by resigning. On the other hand, Joe Bielke-Peterson, the much maligned Joe Bielke-Peterson, refused to get involved in politician superannuation well that's the, that goes to character doesn't it it just shows the the character of the, of the people concerned um but most these days everybody's out for a grab of one sort or another if i just may just go back um to what we were talking before, about a little before earlier. we do that could we just uh, briefly go to a break and we'll come back to what you're about to say thank you jim this is uh David Flint, uh, and uh, it's in Conversations with Conservatives from Safe Worlds TV. Hello everyone, I'm Paul Higgins, and welcome to Safe Worlds TV, the global marketplace, the world leader in internet TV and semantic search, the home of free enterprise, the level playing field that all the world can use for electronic business. With Safe Worlds TV, every business in every country of the world can now be involved in the world economy. There are no barriers to entry, 
even the poorest countries and the smallest businesses can be involved. The system is simple. Every country divides into 12 headline channels. Every channel is a gateway to an unlimited number of related community channels. Every community is a social network and a marketplace to sell products and services. There is no limit to the number of businesses that can be connected into a marketplace. There is no limit to the number of products you can sell. All our channels and marketplaces are designed to keep you entertained and to help you do internet business at a cost that everyone can afford. The amazing semantic technology that underpins SafeWorlds TV allows us to deliver this amazing system to the world. It allows us to accommodate millions of TV channels and marketplaces and to link them together into the global marketplace. The vast global marketplace that we are building is the final piece of the electronic global village. This is the ultimate achievement of the internet. What you see here now is only the tip of the iceberg of semantic services that are coming. Come now and see what we've already got. Choose any country of the world, then select the headline channel that you want to explore. Just point and click and follow the logical tree structure. We think you'll be amazed at what we already have in Safe Worlds TV. When you're ready, click on the button at the bottom of the screen and register to become a user. You can start immediately to create your very own internet TV channel. Enjoy the experience. I'm Paul Higgins for Safe Worlds TV. I'm David Flint, and this is Conversations with Conservatives on Safe Worlds TV from the Gold Coast in Queensland, Australia. And uh, I'm talking to Jim Ball, who's the Conservative Independent for McKellar, a seat in the northern, on the northern beaches of Sydney. Jim, what's the mood in the electorate there? How are they receiving you? Well, I was talking to uh, Fred Nile last week and I was telling him about the mood on the ground in McKellar. And he was saying that it's the same right across the country. The mood is toxic. That's pretty much, that pretty much sums it up. They don't like the, the, the drift of the Liberal Party. They don't like Malcolm Turnbull. Uh, they don't like what's happened with just, not just the Liberal Party, but Rudd, Gillard, Rudd, uh, then Abbott, then Turnbull and the hold up of the budgets. Of course, remember, it's 85 billion that they've been holding up for three years. They've decided to, the Labor Party and in the Senate has decided that uh, they'll, they'll allow that through, as far as I understand it. But I guess the best way to describe the mood would be to cite the Trump phenomenon in the US. Now, what's happened there, and, and the, the elites pretend, I think they're pretending, not to get what's going on and why it's come to this impasse and why Trump is doing so well. It's, I'll say, try and say this in <laughs> words of a couple of syllables for those that don't understand. The phenomenon is because the parties have deserted their base. It's as simple as that. Uh, they're looking after all these sectional interests, whether it be ethnic or religious or indigenous or gender. Everybody's got a seat at the table, but middle Australia is out there saying, well, what about us? We paid the taxes, and this is what's happening in America. Middle America likes Trump because he is saying what they're thinking. Would you and say there's a similar situation in Europe where new parties are emerging and where the British seem to be about to vote, at least in a significant amount, perhaps a majority, mm. to leave the European Union? That's, that's right. And it's all because well, you've got Malcolm Turnbull chasing uh, well, you've got Bill Shorten chasing the Greens to the left. Malcolm Turnbull is chasing Labor to the left. 
And so in doing that, his bleeding off is based on the right. And so, you know, people are saying, well, where, who's looking after the mainstream? Who's looking after Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Average? There was an excellent column by uh, Paul Kelly in the Australian, and I'll just read a, a couple of sentences. The culture of complaint partly justified lurches out of control, lurches out of control, fed by public anger, acrimonious social media, and a coarsening in public life. In this cauldron, ideas that have governed prosperity and success are now under assault from the extremes of left and right. In extreme form, people feel the system is rigged against them. They are retaliating, part, uh, calculated, party rational, in an age of economic and technological disruption. Large segments of the community have simply said, you want disruption, we'll give you disruption. And then it goes on to say, the mood in the Australian election is in disengagement and disillusion with the main parties. The principal contest is coalition versus Labor, yet there's another issue at stake, whether this poll, this election, sees an unprecedented number of minor parties and independent candidates in evidence of a growing revolt against the Australian system. And, I think that's uh, what you're going to see in the Senate. If Malcolm Turnbull thought he had a mess before in the Senate, I think he's a double the solution. The quote is only 7%. It's not, um, it's not 14%. Yes. And I think he's going to see more minor parties, more fringe groups, more independents in the Senate. And that's going to create more chaos. And if he gets back, just say he scrapes back, he's most unlikely to be able to get the, the legislation which triggered the double dissolution through. It won't get through the Senate probably and probably won't get through a, a, a joint meeting of the two houses if one is held. And well, you, you'd wonder why he held a double dissolution at this time. Well, it's, I guess you'd file that under the category it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, his, like his decision to back in 2009 to support Kevin Rudd's emissions trading scheme. That's right. That ended badly, as I recall. And that's what brought him undone the first time around. The other own goal, I don't know he's got a tin ear or who's advising him. Two weeks ago, thereabouts, he bagged Pauline Hanson. Not only bagged her, but he said... Uh, she or people like her have no place in Parliament. Words to that effect. Yes, not welcome in Australian politics. Yes, and I'm thinking, now Malcolm, you've just elected Pauline uh, Hanson, whether you like it or not, because a lot of people would, and me, I wouldn't be voting for Pauline, but the point is, she has a big appeal. And the thing is that by saying what he said, he insults the intelligence of those people. And apart from that, it's up to the people to decide who gets to go to Canberra. Exactly. It's not for him to say that a certain sort of, uh, group of people should never be in Parliament. Just on another issue, uh, obviously voters know the difference between state and federal elections, but I think some state issues may be uh, very important up there on the northern beaches. Yes, I mean, the list is long. Um, we're a blue ribbon seat and we don't get the blue ribbon service. That's basically it. It's been a Liberal seat for 67 years, 1949. There was one blip of about 12 months, I think, when uh, a Liberal went independent back in the late 70s. He couldn't get a, a ministership. Uh, Fraser wouldn't make him a minister, so he spat the dummy and threw the toys out of the cot and became an independent. And then after that, he was never back. That's the only time there's been an independent federally. And we have a range of issues. And the thing is, although a lot of them and most of them are state issues, people don't care. They want them fixed. The lines blur between state and federal. Most people wouldn't even know between state and federal. They just know that this Monavale Road from Monavale to Terry Hills are two lanes. I want it fixed. This uh, road here, Wakehurst Parkway, these are the two main arteries out of, out of the northern beaches. Uh, the Wakehurst Parkway, it's two lanes each way. We want it fixed. They don't care who fixes it. They just want it fixed. And they've been waiting for 67 years. This is a case of blue ribbon seat taken for granted and the other side gives it up as a lost cause. So I'm saying to people, look, make McKellar marginal and you'll make McKellar matter. That's that's really what I'm, I'm saying to people. You won't get things happening until you make it marginal. When I was up there recently, I noticed that one of the things they were concerned with and some of the people who expressed concerns were in fact themselves immigrants. They were concerned with the level of immigration into Sydney because of the infrastructure, but they're also concerned with the fact that uh, we're bringing into Australia people who seem to turn out to be terrorists. 
Well, look, the population growth, and we'll come back to that in a sec, the population growth in Australia is something like 200,000, plus or minus 200,000 a year. Um, now, to, people might say, well, 200,000, how many is 200,000? That's a Geelong or a Sunshine Coast every single year. And we're not increasing, and, and those people uh, from wherever are imposing on the existing infrastructure. We're not in adding to the infrastructure to cope with an extra 200,000 a year. And of course, most of those people want to go to the big cities because that's where the jobs are and that's where the opportunities are. That's where the universities are. Two so, of the big cities. Hmm? Two of the big cities. Yes, they Melbourne, seem to all come to Sydney and Melbourne. That's right. That's right. And so, you know, we just need to start seeing uh, the politicians getting serious instead of talking about infrastructure. I mean, an example I often cite is, and I say to people, name the road coming off the Harbour Bridge heading north. And they go, oh dear, it's the Carl Expressway. No, it's the Bradfield, well, sort of. Pacific Highway, no. The road is called the Warringah Freeway. And it must be the only road in Australia that doesn't go to its destination. <laughs> it goes as far as Camaray. It was finished in 1968. See, Bradfield, back in the days when, when, when our planners yes, had... And, and on that point, I might, uh, we might go to a break and we'll come back to the Bradfield Highway because that's a very interesting question. Thanks. Thank you, David. Thank you. This is uh, David Flint and uh, it, the series is Conversations with Conservatives and I'm speaking to Jim Ball, the Conservative Independent candidate for the seat of McKellar. I'm David Flint, this is Conversations with Conservatives, and I'm in conversation with Jim Ball, the Conservative Independent candidate for the Northern Beaches uh, electorate in Sydney of McKellar. And we were just talking about uh, uh, the road system and uh, infrastructure in Sydney, and uh, Jim, you just made the very interesting point, and I never thought about it before, the Warringah Freeway doesn't go all the way to Warringah. No, it barely gets to uh, it barely gets to Camaray, which is about I don't know two three kilometres from the from the bridge. Um, and the original vision by John Bradfield was for a bridge to see forth and then down the Wakehurst Parkway. Uh, the car government sold off the remains of the road corridor uh, back in the back in the 90s, mid, mid to late 90s. So that will ne will never happen. But that just goes to demonstrate and illustrate the the uh, vision somebody like even Bradfield had. That Warringah Freeway was finished in 1968. Nothing's happened since. The latest, or the, the most recent piece of infrastructure in the area on the Northern Beaches, road infrastructure, is the Roseville Bridge. That was 1966. So you can see what I mean about take, being taken for granted after 67 years of um, a blue ribbon seat with our blue ribbon service. But, but isn't the Liberal government giving you uh, larger councils in the area? Oh, isn't that wonderful? And the people just love it. <laughs> Not. <laughs> no, um, that's the other thing that is outraging people. 
um, there may be a case for it. But the Premier of New South Wales has never put that case. And the uh, KPMG report is secret, is it not? And, well, think, and they may well be compromised. Well, I think now, the, I think the courts last week told, because several of the councils have gone to court, and I think the courts last week said that the government has to release the KPMG. But all this does, it feeds the, the, the narrative in people's minds of cynicism towards the political class and governments, and... And, and just feeds contempt. It's not good. It's not healthy to have. It's a, it feeds a them and us mentality and syndrome. Oh, that's the government. They won't tell us what's going on. We're the people. We're the mugs. And, and you get the impression. Perhaps, you get the impression that the political parties are run by cabals of power brokers who I'll determine who will be pre-selected, not on the basis of merit, but on the basis of loyalty to the power brokers. Well, I, I said at a talk I gave last night and another one yesterday afternoon. It's not of, by, and for the people, it's of, by, and for the lobbyists. That's the way I think. The, the lobbyists don't strut up and down the, the corridors of power for no reason. Exactly, and should we make politicians more accountable? Should they, for example, and I did argue this in a book of mine, uh, politicians, the political parties, in return for all the the various wealth and the exemptions that they get from the laws, the laws in relation to privacy and the electoral laws, shouldn't they be required to run their parties democratically as a, a return for this? Oh, most definitely. And this has been one of the arguments put by people like Ross Cameron uh, and I think John Ruddock, and who have been either suspended or kicked out of the party altogether because they're, they're calling for democracy. And how dare you talk about democracy? So the... Uh, key players in the factions, and particularly lobbyist Michael Fotius, uh, he's got a lot of a lot of pull, and his moderate group, Reed Left, uh, they um, they're the ones orchestrating the the pre-selections in the likes of McKellar and the likes of North Sydney. Uh, they've got a lot of power, and as Tony Abbott said, look, you can be a member of the uh, the Liberal Party executive, I think it was, uh, or a lobbyist. But you can't be both. And uh, uh, just to take it a bit further, do you think that we should be empowering the people, as say the Swiss people are empowered, so that the people can themselves initiate repeals of legislation or even their own legislation or reviews of treaties or refusal to sign treaties, as in Switzerland? Well, look, if it works in Switzerland, it's something we should at least give it, uh, uh, give it a, a shot at, give it a try. Perhaps um, we could I'm hold not, a. I'm not across the detail. Yes, we perhaps we could uh, elect a convention for this purpose. We spent a lot of money a few years ago electing a convention to turn the country into a republic, which uh, Malcolm Turnbull was pushing, and the people rejected that. But perhaps we should now be looking at this sort of reform. Well, it's it's interesting to see that uh, now we've got a referendum coming up on the uh, recognition of Indigenous people in the constitution. And we've got a plebiscite coming up on the whole gay marriage debate. And somebody raised the question the other day about, oh, we don't want a, a plebiscite on the gay marriage business. $158 million it's going to cost. And I just said to the, I think it was the Labor bloke that made this point at this uh, breakfast. I said, well, OK, I know one's uh, a, a, a plebiscite and one's a constitutional matter, but people can walk and chew gum at the same time. Why don't we just give them two bits of paper on the same day and say, you want to vote for recognition? Yeah, there's your bit of paper, yes or no. You want to vote for gay marriage on this? There's your bit of paper, yes or no. There you go, problem solved. Roll them into the one day. No need to have a separate referendum or a separate plebiscite. One of the treasures I find in the Australian every morning is the spendometer, which <laughs> shows how much the two assassins are offering the people by way of auction, but they're offering it in terms of money that they're going to borrow on our behalf so that the interest bill will be even bigger than the mm. billion dollars it is a month now. Look, I, the, the point I make to people, we've got a new hospital being built at French's Forest for the Northern Beaches, level five. It's you know, the hospital for the Northern Beaches. And I say to people, look, every time you drive past that hospital, because it may be difficult for you to get your head around how much is a billion dollars. Just look at that hospital, and that's a billion dollars, plus or minus, a little more, a little less. Um, I said, now, we're shipping out 
in interest every year, 12 of those hospitals. So they, I say that so they can get a fix on on a, what, a, what a tangible asset worth a billion dollars looks like. So they can then equate that to you know, $12 billion a year in interest. Thank you, Rudd Gillard Rudd. And if we keep on doing this, and they're both doing it, aren't they? Both Turnbull is being more moderate in that regard, but they're both increasing the debt. This will, the, the experts say, result in our losing our triple A rating, and that will put up the rate of interest mm. as, the, as the amount of interest goes up because the, the total amount of capital borrowed will also go up. This That's seems right. to be rather extraordinary, doesn't it? Uh, frightening, I think, is the word. Frightening, uh, yes. And I, I think this may come sooner than we think. The mining boom has come off. Uh, everybody's looking around saying, well, what's going to fund all this recurrent expenditure that we were committed to when the, when times were good? It's one thing to you know, build productive infrastructure that uh, adds weight to the economy, but a lot of the stuff has just been handouts. And, and the Conservatives, John Howard did it as well with family benefits A and B and all the rest of it, Gillard with the NDIS and so on. And so we're now we're stuck with these, these uh, massive payments every single year and once again, it's you try and wind that back. It, you can't get that toothpaste back into the tube anytime soon. And uh, I read uh, that the Labor Party is going to reduce or stop uh, the purchase. I, I think we spend special several million dollars on buying bean bags. Why we buy bean bags, I don't know. But apparently, that is one of the savings. Bean bags, mind um, you. I noticed uh, the language, the Orwellian language. They're always talking about savings. Uh, they increase tax and they call it savings. Well, that is extraordinary. And on that point, uh, time has caught up with us. This has been a very interesting conversation. Thank you so much and wish you well in your campaign. Thank you so much, Professor Flint. It's been great talking to you. And this is David Flint. And uh, this is in the program Conversations with Conservatives. And I've been speaking to the Conservative independent candidate for the seat of McKellar in Sydney in the coming federal elections. <laughs>